Judges chapter nine, we'll get there in a second. Judges chapter nine, this is kind of an interesting message. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is interesting. Turn to your second choice, say, he means it, it's interesting. It's, it's weird. Because I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's Christmas time, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, we should, you know, message about Jesus, the story of Jesus. And I don't know, I was just like in my own time with the Lord and just praying and reading and God just kept bringing me back to this story that we're gonna read here in just a moment. And he, I don't know, it just, I don't know, it just kept being light, lit up on my heart. And uh, sometimes you just gotta really lean in what God's speaking to me, what, what God's speaking to us. Uh, I, I'm gonna always strive to never preach from a place where I'm gonna ask you to do something or, do, or tell you to do something that I'm not first going to submit myself to. So um, this is something that just God's been speaking to me about. And I'd love to read a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna read more than I did for the last service just for context here. But uh, Judges chapter nine, and I'm gonna actually start here in verse three. I'll give you a little bit of context, but uh, Abimelech is the son of a man named Gideon, and Abimelech is one of 70 different sons. Gideon was busy, his daddy was busy. So he had 70 sons, and um, you know, put two and two together, your college age figured out. Um, <laughs> So he speaks to his family, all the house of his mother's house, and this is what this man Abimelech says. Which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Gideon reign over you, or that one reign over you? And his mother's brother spoke all of these words, and their hearts were inclined to follow Abimelech. And Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. I'm gonna jump down here to verse 16. Now therefore, this is Jotham speaking, another one of Gideon's sons speaking to Abimelech. If you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you've dealt well with Jerubal in his house, and if you've done all these things that he deserves, jump down to verse 19. If you've acted in truth and sincerity, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo and let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. Now, the first time I read this, I'm like, I just didn't really understand a lot of what was going on. So for context, Gideon has 70 different sons. And of these 70 sons, one of them's named Abimelech. Gideon, of course, is famous for his battle with 300 men fighting against the Midianites where he would devour an entire army defeat an entire army, 300 people against 20,000. God uses Gideon to do this great and mighty thing. And then Gideon's family, Gideon's 70 sons, are put in positions of authority over the kingdom of Israel. They're given different responsibilities and roles to help lead throughout the kingdom. Gideon dies, and one of his sons, Abimelech, rallies all these people to his side and says, is it not better for just one person to lead instead of everybody leading, instead of all of these 70 sons leading? Is it not better for me to lead? What Abimelech does is he rallies all of these people to his side. He wages war on the rest of Gideon's family and ends up killing all of his brothers in this battle for kingship. I was reading this story, it came across my timeline and it just clicked and I just found myself reading old historical stories and I read the story of Julius Caesar and in 44 BC, that's when Julius Caesar was first put into power and Julius Caesar was quickly named, they gave him this title, the dictator for life and many people believe that the moment Julius Caesar took power that it would ultimately mean the end of the Roman Republic. So there was this group of people, dozens of senators that rallied together that called themselves the Liberators. They banded together and one of their main conspirators was Marcus Junius Brutus. Julius reigned for only about three months because on March 15th, 44 BC, Julius Caesar was stabbed 23 times by Brutus and the other senators. In their minds, they killed a dictator and secured freedom. In, in their minds, they protected the country's freedom, and in their minds, they saved the people from sure downfall. Instead, the death of Caesar ultimately led to civil wars, the death of the Roman Republic, 
and the birth of the Roman Empire. They meant to take down a dictator, but they inevitably created an empire. The very thing they thought to destroy, they ended up creating. This led to civil war. Uh, Julius Caesar's nephew, Octavian, would rise up and claim power. Another one of his deputies would try and claim power for himself, and this led to turmoil in the country. Thousands were dead. Eventually, the republic was destroyed. The empire was born. But because of this conflict, the entire Roman people would end up being annihilated. The entire downfall of a nation started with an idea. The entire downfall of a nation started with doubt, a conspiracy. And if you're like me, you're like, what does this have to do with Christmas? And you're like, I don't know. I don't know either, but this is where I'm going, so go with me here. A conspiracy, by definition, is an unlawful, harmful, or evil plan formulated in secret by two or more parties. A conspiracy is an evil plan. It's, it's, it's unlawful, it's harmful, it isn't right, it's, it's divisive, it's a plan hatched in secret. Is anybody else a secret conspiracy theorist? Like you, you, you get caught down the rabbit hole, like you're reading all these different conspiracies. No one else? Y'all are liars, you're liars. It's so like, my gosh, the Colorado airport, and you're like, what does this mean? No one, it, yes, I know, it wasn't the Titanic. It was like, it's crazy. But I, it's a conspiracy. If you could title this message anything, I promise I'm going somewhere with it. I want to talk to you about a Christmas conspiracy. A Christmas conspiracy. How did this plan with Brutus start? How did this plan start? Because at some point, it was just a thought that he had. Maybe, just maybe, Caesar's not doing all the right things. I don't really like how he's doing that. I don't like how he said that. That thought that he has eventually just turns to some whispers. He pulls somebody else aside. He's like, hey, have you noticed how Caesar's, you know, making some of these calls and stuff? Like, he's throwing a toga party? That's kind of weird, you know? I don't, I don't know about that. But these whispers eventually turn to conversations where one or two were gathered. Eventually, there were dozens of these senators all brought together. And eventually, those conversations quickly led to action where it's not just enough to talk about it, to be offended, to be upset. Now we're gonna take action and they end up committing murder. The very thing they tried to achieve, they ended up destroying. Entire nation completely destroyed. I think how often, man, we, we can find ourselves very carefully, if we're not cautious, offenses can creep in. Whispers, insecurities, doubt can creep in. Have you ever really noticed? Have you seen? Do you really agree with what the Bible says about this? Do you really think God would say? Do you really think this? We see Brutus's life play out to the downfall of a nation because ultimately conspiracies, and another way you could say conspiracy is division. Division cripples destiny. Division cripples destiny. Jesus talks about this in Mark 322 says the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said Jesus has Beelzebub which is a demonic spirit because Jesus was healing people and performing great miracles and the Pharisees didn't understand how Jesus was doing that so they said it's the ruler of demons that he casts out demons so Jesus called them to himself and he said to them in parables how can Satan cast out Satan if a kingdom is divided against itself that kingdom cannot stand and if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. See, God understands it. The enemy understands it. That in order for something to be successful, in order to live a fruitful life, in order to accomplish anything great, there must be unity. For where there's division, there's never any accomplishments. The fastest way to end something the fastest way to stop what God's doing in your life is division. You know it on a team, if anybody's ever played sports. The fastest way to lose your game is when the offense starts blaming the defense. Well, so it's their fault. Well, it's their fault. Well, hold on. It's not about that. You're one team. The moment there's division, all sorts of hell breaks out. So in order for success, there must be unity. Church works the same way. Any kind of conspiracy must be unwrapped, dealt with, and replaced with truth. Because God will never bless division. God will never bless division, but where there is unity, God's blessings follow. So we must remain aware and on alert to protect, guard, and defend unity at all costs. So I thought in this Christmas season, 
I've got my Christmas tree here. Is anybody done with Christmas shopping yet? Anybody even started Christmas shopping yet? Who's gonna wait till next week and just figure it out then? God bless you, figure it out. <laughs> but I thought maybe we could start a little early and just kind of unwrap some presents real quick. I got my little presents under here because I think, man, the same way you, you would try and find some truth in a conspiracy theory, you gotta unwrap, you gotta dig through some layers. In the same way in our lives, if we wanna make sure there's no division in our lives, if we wanna make sure the enemy's not crept in with access in our lives, in his church, in our relationships, in our families, we need to be willing to unwrap some conspiracies to see if the enemy has a foothold. So the first indicator that there might be division in your life, that there might be a divisive influence in your life. First indicator we're gonna unwrap and look at. Y'all, do y'all like put the paper in the bag right when you take the, the presents out of the, the wrapping? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, does anybody grow up like that in that kind of stressful environment? <laughs> so give me the paper, honey. You know? My mom was like, give me the paper right away, right into the trash bag. I do that now though, so maybe I'm trauma dumping, I don't know, but hey. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, the first conspiracy you got to unwrap is doubt. If, if you can see some doubt in your life, maybe, just maybe, the enemy's got a foothold with division. Is there anything in your life, this is a question you got to ask, is there anything in your life that's bringing doubt against God? Is there anything or anybody that's bringing doubt against God or against the things of God or God-appointed leadership? just sneaky. Like when I think about doubt, I think it's just so sneaky. Because here's Gideon, right? He fights with all these soldiers. He's done this great thing. His sons grow up in this amazing environment where they're victorious. It's wonderful. He dies. And then his son, Abimelech, goes to his mother's family's house. And he rallies all these people once his father's died. And he just starts by asking them a question. Which is better? Which is better that they rule or that I rule? Simple question, right? It's not, it's, it's not a big deal. It seems subtle enough. It seems small enough. But the tactics of the enemy are always the same. Wasn't that the same way in the Garden of Eden when the enemy approached Eve? Did God really say you couldn't eat from any fruit on any tree? When Satan approached Jesus in the wilderness, if you are really the son of God, command those bread to become stones. He's questioning his identity. It's just a small little doubt. Is somebody trying to get you to question what God has already revealed to you? Because that's what the enemy will do. See, when there's people in your life, you have to know they're either sent by God or sent by the enemy. There's no neutrality in life. They're either sent by God to strengthen you or sent by the enemy to create doubt or to take you out. It's doubtful, it's sneaky. Proverbs 12, 17 says that he who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. So you have to take account of the people around you, and then even take a look at your own life. Is my speech true? Is what I say true? Is, are what people telling me true? Or is it doubtful? Is it sneaky? Is it creating suspicion? What's their speech? What does their life look like? You know when somebody tries to get you into their drama and their gossip and they pull you to silence, like, have you heard about so-and-so? And they said this and they said that. Or it's like something you like really don't want to hear and you hear, there's just like this weight on you. It's like this pit in your stomach. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't wanna know that, I don't wanna know that, I can't do anything about that. When you hear something that could not be true, it just makes your stomach turn and you have that weight. But Jesus says that the truth will set you free, that there's freedom in truth. So what does Matthew 18 say? That if you're hearing something, gossip, lies, deceit about somebody else, or if somebody talking to you about something is not a part of the solution of that issue, that is gossip and the Bible calls that sin. That's sin, it's deceitful, it's divisive, it, it divides people. Matthew 18 principles, be a part of the solution. If you can be a part of the solution, if you have a problem with somebody, go to them. We are to be a truth seeker. I know you're like, what does this have to do with Christmas? I'm going somewhere, I promise. Number two, the next conspiracy we need to unwrap to make sure that the enemy does not have influence in our life. It's so much fun unwrapping presents, I just love it so much. Take that, mom, I'm leaving the paper everywhere. <laughs> but the next indicator that there might be division in your life is you have to ask yourself the question, are the people around me motivated by selfishness or are there desires in my own life that are motivated by selfishness? Is there a selfish spirit 
in my life. It's, what is selfish? It's self-seeking. It's self-promoting. It, it pulls away. It isolates. It's, it, it just seeks to get you on your own. And, and I think about Abimelech in this story, right? He says, what's better, that all of Gideon's sons lead or just me? He really only cares himself. It cares about himself. He really is only trying to make himself better. And in order to unwrap conspiracy and see if there's division in your life, you have to ask yourself, are the people around me only self-focused? When I go at life, am I going at it with the filter of being self-focused? Am I being self-focused? John 10, Jesus tells us exactly what the church is like. Jesus says in verse seven, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All whoever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anybody enters his kingdom by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture, find rest. This is what Jesus says are the tactics of the enemy. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but Jesus has come that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. A divisive person only wants to steal, kill, and destroy what God is doing in your life. They only care about themselves, and they really are self-focused on their feelings. And this is what happens so often in church. People that are motivated by selfishness are very good at rallying other people to their side, are very good at false charity, making it seem like they're really great. Jesus says you have to be careful of the people that like to pray on the street corners and look all holy and great, but really, God called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs because they just like to outwardly look like they know what they're talking about and outwardly look holy but inward, there's, there, there's pride. It's just self-seeking. And as I'm talking about this, I don't want you to hear my heart is judgmental. I'm talking to myself. If this message is for anybody tonight, it's for me. It's, it's to make sure that, that the devil has not in some way, shape, or form has been given a foothold in my life. Because if we want God to do anything great in our lives, there can be no room for division. There can be no room for selfishness. There can be no room for doubt. And we have to be cautious because a lot of times we can be motivated on how we feel. Well, church doesn't really just feel like the right thing for me. I don't know why, but you do this when you're feeling. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I don't really feel like raising my hands in worship. I don't really feel like I like this song. Well, if worship was just about the songs that you like, wouldn't we be worshiping you? Or is worship about getting our focus off of ourselves and onto God? Oh, I really don't feel like giving. Well, is it a principle or is it not? Is it in this book or is it not? I don't really feel like serving. I don't really feel, I mean, and they, or you can get people in your ear. Man, I feel like that church is really just taking up all your time. You're there all the time. You're sure, I don't know if I feel that. I don't know if I feel God there or not. I don't know if I feel. Feelings were never meant to take the front seat. Feelings follow choices. As long as you're waiting to feel good all the time, you're gonna live a disappointed life. But if you can make the decision to, in spite of how I feel, Lord, I've got no reason. I've got every reason to keep my hands in my pocket, my arms crossed. But regardless of how I feel, I choose to worship you. I choose to follow your word. I choose to be in this book. I choose to pray. When you can make the choices, your feelings will follow. So you have to be careful to not be consumed with self. Selfishness, or being selfless, I should say, is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself Less. God's word is convicting. It might not always be fun to hear and fuzzy feelings, but it will always be fruitful. It will always be fruitful in our lives. If you ever leave worship or prayer or church service still focused on yourself, I've been told this, I told this, I was told this a while ago by one of my mentors. If you leave a church service or prayer or worship or reading your Bible and you're still focused on yourself, you didn't stay there long enough. You didn't stay there long enough because it's not about us. When we get saved, it's no longer about me. It's about the people that don't know Jesus yet. And as long there, as there are those that don't know Jesus, we as the church have a job to do. I can't be focused on myself because we got family members to reach. We got loved ones to reach. We got friends to go after. We've got the gospel to share. I can't be focused on myself. When you unwrap that selfishness, you gotta fill it with the Holy Spirit. Fill it with selflessness. I'm gonna open another present because we're just unwrapping all sorts of conspiracies. Look at this. This one says, the Titanic never happened. No, I'm kidding, That's, that one did. That one did happen. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. But if you're looking for an indicator, if there's division, maybe if there's people around you that are divisive, 
a good indicator that it's a divisive spirit or divisive influence in your life is if you're looking at somebody's life and it's unaccomplished, unaccomplished. Here's what I mean by that. If we look at Abimelech's story, he could never lead. Abimelech could not lead. He, 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 he couldn't lead. What did he have to do? He had to wait for his dad to die so that he could go destroy and take over everything that his dad built. He couldn't build his own kingdom. He couldn't rally his own people together. All his kingdom was built on was tearing down anybody else's accomplishments. So he has to kill his brothers. And I think about the enemy. He's a taker. He's a taker. He's not accomplished anything. The enemy's not a creator. He's not a creator. He's an imitator of God. So if he's not a creator, that means he cannot create new tactics. He can maybe present it in different ways, but his tactics are the same. The enemy cannot prevail against the church. The Bible tells us that. Jesus says that, that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. You have the authority. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. You have authority over hell, over sin, over temptation. You have authority. The only way the enemy has authority is if we give it to him. The only way you lose a battle is somewhere we let the enemy have a foothold. Every battle I've ever lost is because I've simply allowed influence to somebody that's already been defeated. He can't attack the church. He can't take it down. But if the enemy can get a divisive foothold in the door, he can tear it apart from the inside out. And I see it all the time. Where there's disunity, there's all other types of evil. Where there's doubt, gossip, lies, deceit, it just starts to tear the church apart. It starts to tear relationships apart, tear families apart. People are either sent by God or they're sent by the enemy. When trying to determine if somebody is divisive or not, you have to ask this question, what have they built in their life? People are so easy, especially nowadays, to follow random people on TikTok and Instagram just because they sound really good and they say this, present the gospel in this really cool way and wow, that's really awesome, it sounds great, but I always ask this question, what have they built? What's the fruit of their life? Because people can say anything and sound really spiritual and sound really cool, but what have they built? What's their life? What's the fruit of their life? That's what Jesus is saying here. Be careful of people that are really flattering with the tongue. Be careful of that. You have to look at what they've built because more often than not, if you see a whole bunch of unaccomplishments, that's gonna be a divisive person and that's gonna be somebody that ultimately, if you allow a foothold into your life, it's gonna mean, it's gonna mean destruction for your life. And I'm almost done, but that, that was such a quick point because it ultimately leads to this. If you allow doubt to creep in and allow people motivated with selfishness to creep in, you allow that into your life, eventually this is what leads in your life. You're gonna see a whole lot of worthlessness and recklessness. If you wanna know if somebody's sent by the enemy, relationship is not good in your life, you're gonna see a whole lot of worthlessness and recklessness. Because the Bible tells us in Judges 9 that the people that followed Abimelech were worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. Verse four, they were worthless and reckless. You know what, what kind of people follow division? Worthless and reckless. You wanna know what the life of a divisive, gossiping, lying person is? It's worthlessness and recklessness. Worthlessness, it's, it's the spirit of division is always going to end in destruction. It's always going to end bad. Abimelech, he reigns for a little while. It started with doubt and he rallies all these people to his side. Well, really, he's just really selfish. Really, he's just trying to promote himself. He doesn't have any accomplishments for himself, so he has to go and take it from his brothers. So he takes an army of people and he goes and he kills 68 of the brothers. He thinks he's killed all of them. So he reigns for a short while. He reigns for about three years. But ultimately, he met his end when he was leaning against a tower and he didn't know it, there was a woman up top of the tower who was God-fearing, loved the Lord, and saw him at the bottom, took a giant rock and dropped it on his head. What's so interesting too is I love this. This is just a little, this is a little extra treat, not in my notes. But Abimelech started rallying 
all of these people together by going to his mother's house and pleading with the women in his family and then all of the people in their lives, wouldn't it be better if I led you? Couldn't I do such a great job to serve you? Come on, you deserve this, you're great. Well, in Judges 9, verse 53, says a certain woman dropped, they don't have it, it's okay, don't worry. But a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me that a woman killed me. So his young man thrust him through and Abimelech died. Isn't that kind of interesting that I thought Abimelech was a champion of the people. He loved people and clearly, homie was a little sexist right there. That's like, that's crazy to me. Well, your heart's always gonna be revealed. Selfishness, doubt, division, it's always gonna be revealed. Try and put on a good face, fool people for a little while, but man, his heart was evil. His heart was evil. He thought so lowly of people because that's what the enemy will use a divisive spirit to do. He don't care about you. He don't care about you. He don't care if you get hurt. He don't care what happens to you. The enemy will use people in your life. That's why it's so, we have to be so cautious of the people in our life, so cautious of the influence we lend our ear to, so cautious of who we allow into our circle because a divisive life doesn't amount to anything. It doesn't breed success. Recklessness and worthlessness is what follows a divisive life, somebody that's just gossiping and deceitful. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Psalm 23. If you've been in church, you know it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me in beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Just think about the imagery, right? We just read that Jesus is our shepherd. He's leading us through these beautiful moments in life. He leads us to find rest. He leads us, we can trust him. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because his rod and his staff, they comfort me. Even when we've got reason to doubt and question, we can trust God. Has he not been faithful? Has he not been good? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, this is my favorite part, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You want to follow division, follow people that want to divide God's house, cause drama and issues in God's house, issues in your relationships? You can follow that, but worthlessness and recklessness is what follows or you can trust God, trust his word, trust God's leadership, trust God's plan for the church, trust in that leadership. What follows you? Goodness and mercy. I want goodness and mercy to follow you. I want goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life and will dwell in God's house forever. What Abimelech didn't realize is there was one son who survived. a young man named Jotham. The very first scripture we read tonight was Jotham speaking to the people, saying, if it's true, I'm not here to tell you what God's told you to do or not do. Only God knows the heart. So I'm not, I'm in the same position. That's what Jotham told the people. He said, look, I'm not telling you it's right or wrong. All I'm saying is if God told you people to follow Abimelech and treat Gideon's sons that way, then God bless you. But if God didn't tell you to do that, he curses them and says, let fire fall on you. Man, that's kind of scary. I kind of had to think about the decisions in my own life. Did God tell me to do that? Is that from God? Because if it's from God, there's blessing. But if it's not from God, there's... Did God really tell you to stir up those issues? God tell you to leave? God tell you to do that? Did God tell you to do that? If he did, I'm not here to say he did or didn't. If he did, God bless you. But if he didn't, man, it's a reminder to all of us. 
I, I don't wanna live outside of God's covering. I don't wanna live outside of God's blessing, but God cannot bless division. It's not in his nature. He cannot do it. So Jotham survives, and what's his response? If you've acted truthfully, God bless you. See, God gave Jotham victory and freedom. Goodness and mercy followed him because he was able to get the people back to the real meaning of what it means to follow God. And that's what Christmas is. That's what Christmas is. It's getting our focus back on the true meaning. See, Jotham had to remind the people what his dad did for them. He had to remind them what his dad did for them. In Judges 9, verse 17, he's telling the people, look, my father fought for you. My father risked his life for you. My father delivered you out of the hands of the Midianites. But you've risen up against my father. What did Gideon do? He fought for them. He risked his life for them. He delivered them. Jotham had to remind the people what his father did for them. I know you turned your back and you were divisive and you were led astray, but you chose violence. You chose to rebel. You chose division when all my father ever did was love you. And living right puts a target on your back. And if we're not careful, the enemy will creep in and he'll use doubt and selfishness. He'll use all these tactics to try and cause division in your life, to get you to sway, to get you off the path that God's leading you on, to get you to think that the church is evil and out to get you, that God's word is outdated, that he's mean and judgmental. Because as long as the enemy can get us to fight with each other, the church will never be fruitful. But we have to realize something. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.10, I plead with you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. See, we avoid the conspiracy of the enemy. We avoid the division of the enemy by being joined in the same mind, the same unity, of what Christmas is all about. And how do we do that? We remember like Jotham what our Father did for us. How can we act in hatred towards one another, in unforgiveness towards one another, when God so loved us that while we were sinners, he died for us? How could we withhold forgiveness from someone when we owed a debt that could never be paid and God paid that debt for us? How could we hold bitterness when time and time again I failed God and he still loves me? I have to remind myself even to this day that there's nothing I can do to outrun God's love. There's nothing you can do to outrun God's love. There's nothing. I don't care what you've done, how you've messed up. God is crazy about you. but we hold hatred in our heart or offense in our heart or bitterness in our heart. We don't fall into the trap of conspiracy by remembering what our father did. Because like Gideon, I could think of someone much like him, only much greater, and people still rejected him. What did Jesus ever do but fight for us? What did Jesus ever do but deliver us out of the hands of sin and the devil? What did Jesus ever do but not only risk his life but lay down our life for us? What did Jesus ever do but love us? And people are offended and conspire against our Father every day. And I just felt in my heart that we need to be a generation like Jotham that rises up and in the face of division, in the face of doubt, in the face of the schemes of the enemy, we can remember what our father did for us. We can remember what Christmas is about in all the busyness and all the drama and all the issues that we're facing. Can we take a moment and remember that God fights for us, that God has delivered us from the grip of sin and that God was born on this earth 
to die for you and I. He gave his life for us. Oh, how dare I hold bitterness in my heart, hatred in my heart, offense in my heart. Why? I'm getting my eyes off of what matters. God loves us and God needs us to reach those that don't know him yet. We're not the enemy. The people in this room, the people in this church, they're not your enemy. They're not your enemy. As long as you think they are, the enemy wins. And I just felt in my spirit in this Christmas season, we need to be united on the main thing. It's just about Jesus. It's just about reaching souls. It's just about reminding ourselves, man, I've, we've gotten our eye off the ball. Jesus, we refocus on you.